Bienvenidos and welcome to another edition of Black and Azul. I'm Charles, he's Joel. Lots to unpack after a 2-1 loss for the San Jose Earthquakes in their home opener and Matias Almeida's first competitive game in charge. We'll talk about it, we will discuss it. We've got some video for you. We'll also get you prepped for Minnesota United coming to San Jose in town. We'll also chat a little bit about what's going on with fans in Major League Soccer, a hot topic issue. So this is episode three of Black and Azul. Interesting night at Avaya Stadium. Quakes losing two goals to one to Montreal. Impact scoring first in the 11th minute, having the lead for a little bit of time, probably around 20 minutes or so, conceding and then conceding right before the break in the 44th minute to kind of a dubious goal as well. The Quakes haven't won in six months. It's been 190 days since they brought home three points. Joel? Yeah, obviously uh, not a good result for the San Jose Earthquakes, not the way that most people would want it to start, especially here in San Jose. But, you know, like I said before, this was a good platform to Matias Almeida to continue to establish that identity that they're still trying to find within the field. And, you know, it, it was it just wasn't enough. Uh, the the formation, the, the tactics just look too green still with this team and I think they really obviously weren't able to properly execute their man-to-man -man marking scheme. Uh, it was evident that in the corner kick set piece in which the Montreal Impact were able to score, they kind of let Ignacio Piatti a little loose there and he's the type of player that is going to punish you, right? You give him inches and he's going to make you pay for it. And not only that, obviously the sublime pass from Diallo to Tider it was it was just really on a plate for for Tider for the designated player. Not really at fault was the man to man marking, but more of a world class pass. Like I said before, all in all, though, you know the earthquakes are going to have to bounce back from this. Like you said, it's been six months, a hundred and ninety days. Those are numbers that just really don't leave a good impression on anyone. Uh, the Quakes are very much still in rock bottom. I don't think there's anywhere further down to move to. This is this is pretty much it. They've crashed completely down. They're six feet under. And now it's Matias Almeida who's going to have to revive this team some way, somehow. Uh, we'll talk about the process later. We'll talk about what the players have said inside the locker room, dive in a little bit into their minds, which obviously has a lot of substance to it. But yeah, not not an encouraging start for the San Jose Earthquakes. Not the worst performance, but like Matias Almeida said, not the ideal result. So big picture, they lost, but smaller picture and diving into the nitty gritty now, Magnus Eriksson opens the scoring in the 11th minute, playing underneath in that number 10 spot right underneath Wando, not bad opening his account early. No, like we said, you know, the the camera was going to be on Magnus Eriksson. The limelight, the spotlight was gonna be on Magnus Eriksson from the start. You know, the the whole, like we, we talked about before as well on the show, the rumor saga behind his name, the pressure for him to, for him to perform after what was a subpar year. And what does he do? 10 minutes into the game, he, he hushes the crowd, right, with that blistering shot that hit the back of the net. Uh, you know, my question with Magnus Eriksson is, is he going to be able to keep this up? I, I, think, I think for now he does have Matias Almeida's confidence. He has that number 10 role pretty much locked in. Is he the best player in within the Earthquakes that can flourish in that position probably not I would say that that is probably Vaco's position or should be naturally Vaco's position right. but it's not uh, it, it's Magnus Eriksson's and and ultimately I, I believe he has nothing to lose and everything to gain this season right he's gonna have to approach it with that type of mentality he's already off to a brilliant start and and I think he's earned it uh, pretty well after that game yeah 
I mean, he's a player that can play on either one of those flanks. He can play in the middle, potentially even box to box or holding midfield, you know, at, at some point potentially, but probably not his best position either. Um, you know, and we, we talked about it at the top of the show, episode one, you know, is it going to be his year? He's going to need to continue to perform, as, as you had said, and going to have to be a key piece in this side in front of the two holding midfield players. There's too much money. There's too much money tied to his name. He's He has all the pressure to perform. Um, I think he's convinced, obviously, the front office that he could be an integral part of the team, or at least of the attack. Uh, but now he needs to convince the fans, right? Which was pretty much the the rift in the off season. It wasn't it wasn't Magnus Eriksson versus the front office. It wasn't Magnus Eriksson versus his teammates or the locker room. It was Magnus, and it has been Magnus Eriksson versus the fans. And I think he's he's off to a good start in that section. Speaking of goals, the second goal was not reviewed for offside. It's a bit dubious. Lamentable as I said, call. As I said at the as said at the top of the top of the show and clearly a couple calls being called back in the Champions League this week for VAR. So where do you stand with this? Yeah, it was just lamentable, painful to watch now in hindsight looking back at that. It, it was to me it was clearly an offside and you know maybe there will be the counter argument that it's too close to call, but I, I still believe that at least the head official should channel VAR. I mean, why are you going to implement this if you're not going to use it, right? It's the first week. It's it's good to, to, to put VAR on the map the first week of MLS and to make sure that it fulfills what it's destined to do, right? And that is to make the right call. I think the the referees completely blew it on this one uh, like they did against the Earthquakes uh, in that preseason match against Seattle as well. You know, unfortunately, these are the type of scenarios that games breed, but atrocious call by all means. Poorly, poorly done, in my opinion, by the refs. And obviously the refs are going to have to warm up to this very quickly as it's, you know, something that needs to be used and it's there as a tool to be able to use. So if it's there use it if you can. Now on to Guram Kashia's post-game comments, hearing what he had to say after the 2-1 loss. Some interesting comments here also about how much film he's had to digest and how much information is thrown at him from the coaching staff. Like learning still, we are in the process that we are watching the hours of videos every week. Even on your own? Not only know, but like mm. we sit here for after the training, one and one, one and a half hours, wow. and he just show us last week like you know, around uh, 40 videos from the friendly game. So okay. imagine how much work he puts and how much hours himself right. to cut this video. Right. And that's uh, also we we trying to to learn, but it's so much information, you know. We are football players. We are not soccer players. We are not most intelligent uh, <laughs> athletes in the sport world. That yeah, we are trying to take all the information and right. you know like uh, bring it on the field. But it's not that easy, you know. Like in the 40 videos, I believe it was like seven or eight mine, and uh, yeah, he demands a lot of uh, focus and attention. So you must have heard uh, chatting about video or looking at video for about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, etc. Uh, being thrown at him and other players uh, by this new coaching staff. Yeah, you know, it, it was remarkable to hear Garam Kasha say what he had to say. This is not something that you hear a player talk about uh, week in and week out. What's happening here is that the players are now starting to realize the tactician that Matias Almeida is, the soccer-obsessed person that Matias Almeida truly is. And I don't think the players were expecting this, to be quite honest with you. Despite all of what was said about Matias Almeida, his glory, his triumph, his failures, his career, his long, extensive career, I don't think the players knew how meticulous Matias was or is. And it goes to show also that this team has so much ahead of them still in 2019 and in the years to come in order to try and finally integrate Matias Almeida's philosophy, methodology. It's a process like we've spoken about. And I, I, 
I personally believe that you know this this weighs even a, a bit heavier than than other players because it's Garam Kasha. So I, the way that I see covering this team within the locker room and, and being around the players, Garam Kasha is one of the most astute players that the San Jose Earthquakes have within their roster. A player who's you know has a legacy in, in Vitesse, the Dutch club, uh, a, a staple within that team plays for the Georgian national team and knows the game to the next level, right? He's very passionate about the sport and the way that he speaks about the sport and the way he speaks about his team, especially after defeats, really goes to show the intellect that Garam Kasha has. That was the case on Saturday. And in this case, he was referring to Matias Almeida of just giving them way too much information to process, for him to process at least. He wasn't speaking for the team, he was speaking for himself. Too much to process, that to me was a, a very glaring statement. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, in modern football, you're gonna be thrown a lot of video, you're gonna be thrown a lot of, okay, well, I'm playing left wing today, let's take a look at how the right back does. I'm playing right wing today, let's, take a look at how the left back does or I'm playing left back today I'm right. taking a look at how the right winger does but then again it begs to question how much video is too much video with that also being said well, right you also have to love the transparency from the player saying I liked it I didn't love it but I liked it and it was okay but it was a lot it was a lot for it, me it, right? it's it's too much video okay i i get that but how that then that raises a, i i start to think to myself well how much video has this team been consuming over the past two years or the past year because it wasn't long ago that the san jose earthquake started implementing uh, video cameras in their training sessions as a in part of the 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 newfound relationship with opta this the stats uh company down south so how much video were the, was this team actually consuming beforehand? Were they not consuming enough? Uh, you know, Maybe I, not. I mean, but that's they, they try to emphasize that from from the get go since they introduced those those cameras. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was, like I said, very like a very glaring statement as to, you know, him opening up about this. And, and now me asking myself internally, well, you know, how long have the Quakes been you know, pushing aside video uh, reviews. Well, every every coach obviously has their own method. And so, you know, we'll have to see clearly if it does pay off or not, video or no video, who knows, you know? But I, I thought it was interesting that he said that he didn't actually go home and watch the video. And there are statements out there in the public that there are some players that do go home and watch the video or watch it on their TV. They want to have it in the comfort of their home. So it, it depends now. And a lot of these folks are visual learners. We're coming up in the age of these guys learning and taking a look on YouTube and all their highlight reels are on YouTube. And so therefore, you never know how much video <laughs> is too much video. But despite the loss, Matias Almeida remains upbeat. He was on the sideline, marching up and down it, making sure that he was instructing his team. And that was one of the bright spots from the 2-1 loss, despite the fact that there were no three points and there was not a tie and they scored first and the other team came from behind to beat the Quakes. Matias Almeida was still in the driver's seat doing what he does best. Let's hear his post-game comments. With a lot of intensity, like I do every game, I love this sport. No me gusta perder. I don't like to lose, obviously. Hoy no voy a dormir. Today I'm going to sleep. Tres, cuatro veces. We're going to watch the game three, four times. Pero sé que se ve una luz que viene llegando. But there is a light that's coming. Y y será redoblar y trabajar es la única manera de salir de esta situación. We have to turn over and work. That's the only way to get out of this situation. Me voy contento por el por el rendimiento y obviamente forth. muy triste por haber perdido. And obviously sad having lost. His team scored first and then conceded two goals, conceded a goal right before halftime. But here's a guy that stood right in front of the cameras and remained upbeat. He kept his tempo. He kept his uh, panache and passion that we've seen uh, so clearly since his arrival in San Jose. And uh, yeah, what did you think of his post game? 
I mean, it's a process, right? It's it's the first of many for Matias Almeida and the San Jose earthquakes. Uh, like I wrote, you know, process and development is synonymous to him and the San Jose earthquakes. Now, my question is, how long is this process? What what are we, how many years or how many months or how many weeks are we talking here? Is it a year? Is it a season like many people are signaling? Is it two? Or is it a span of five games like Aram Kasha said after the game on Saturday, who also said that the team is going to compete this season for a playoff spot? I think, you know, these are bold words by Garam Kasha. And I think that, you know, within the Earthquakes locker room, they do believe that it's not a one year process or a six month process. I think the process is closer to a month or two, and this team is going to want to compete for the playoff spot. But, you know, surely I, I don't know if that's going to be done. Uh, th this team has a lot, a lot of ground to make up, and evident to that was the lack of clear cut chances they had in front of goal and also the deficiencies within Matias Almeida's scheme, right? The man marking, the pos controlling possession and getting countered heavily by the opposing team. Yeah, I'm going to go pro con pro with you real quick, just tactically, because we don't want to get into a crazy tactical overview. But for me, uh, one of the positives, one of the pros was Judson uh, in the box-to-box -box role, uh, just in front of uh, Anibal Godoy. He really helped him out uh, big time, and in times when Anibal Godoy was having a really, really difficult time. The con, for me, I, I, I got to see the wingers get, get a little bit uh, greedier. They have to be hungrier. Vaco needs to be able to take players on 1v1 in those wide channels. Same thing with Christian Espinoza. I'd like to see him be able to take on his defender a little bit uh, a little bit quicker, a little, uh, a lot more than, than what he's been doing. Mainly it's just been crosses, which are good. His crosses are great, but he's only serving the ball to one, one or two folks that are able to get on to the end of it. Um, so that that's my con. My other pro uh, in that mix that I like was the little through ball that Vaco played. I've been talking about it on the show um, uh, last week and the week before. I think Vaco is suited to that number 10 position. I think that he could play a little closer and underneath Chris Wondolowski. So I liked what I saw from Vaco as well. Um, but uh, again, we got to see those wingers be able to take on folks 1v1. What's yours? As I was saying, Charles, I, I do think there are some deficiencies in this system. Obviously, like I said, it's, it's still very young. It's, it hasn't really cemented. And some of those things are the man marking scheme. Uh, for times, there's intervals of 10 minutes where it looks impeccable. And then there are 10, 15, 20 minutes of just instability, e.g. Piotti's goal inside the box, being unmarked, having five yards of empty space with three defenders in front of Piotti and no one going to him. Uh, in addition to that, you know, also the lack of cover when on the ball, in possession, and then transitioning to a defensive position and having teams as dynamic and as frenetic as Montreal pushing against. Uh, but, you know, this is a process and, and I think that, you know, process equals hope. So, Hopefully for, you know, the San Jose Earthquakes and for Matias Almeida, as the weeks go by, as Garam Kasha said, this team will be able to find its groove. Uh, it has the talent. It has certain pieces that can really elevate this team to be a playoff contender. I, I truly do believe this team could contend for that fifth or sixth position. No higher than that, though. Uh, it's just going to have to take some time. These, these players are going to have to know each other a little bit better. Uh, Players like Marco Lopez are going to have to really adapt to the physicality of the league. I did think he was one or two steps behind about 50 to 60 minutes of the match. Cristian Espinosa, a player who is known for his dynamic uh, display within the final third, uh, really didn't show that, hasn't really shown that since he arrived in San Jose. And he's just going to have to go and get it. You know, he, he has looked a bit uh, conservative with the ball. He's going to have to attack. He's going to have to try and be the protagonist of this Quakes attack. 
This weekend, the San Jose Earthquakes take on a resurgent side, Minnesota United, that won three goals to two against Vancouver last weekend, coming from behind to win that game. They've retooled their club quite a bit, and they're very much looking the part. They have never been to the playoffs, but I know it's a key component of what they want to do moving forward, and I would probably think that they're going to be a playoff team this year. And also... They're one of two teams the Quakes beat last year, and at the same time, they've never beaten the Quakes or even tied the Quakes. The Quakes have always won. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Minnesota United are the team who are trying really, really hard to align all their facets of the club, right? I think last year, Minnesota United really lacked the the players, right? And, and they obviously lacked the stadium because it wasn't there yet. And the year before then, it was the players with no DPs and really, really minimal impact players. This season, though, the 2019 for Minnesota United is the start of a new era, right? The Allianz Field, and personally to me, the most beautiful field that MLS has to offer. And now they have a contingent of players who can make this team a true playoff contender with players like Miguel Ibarra, Darwin Quintero, Calvo, and then you obviously add the two MLS mainstays in uh, Aiko Parra and Ozzy Alonso. This, this team is dangerous. They're going to really, really complicate things for Matias Almeida and co. on Saturday. Uh, I get it. You know, the odds are with the San Jose Earthquakes, but this is going to be a completely different team right? This is going to be, a, a, a re, like you said, a resurging Minnesota United under Adrian Heath uh, that obviously Matias doesn't take lightly. Let's listen to what he had to say. Y conocemos jugadores, hemos enfrentado jugadores que tienen ellos y tienen jugadores realmente importantes que marcan diferencias. Eh, es un equipo, como todos, difícil. Nosotros nunca, jamás en, en, en nuestro trabajo... Eh, somos de, de pensar que un equipo es más débil nosotros respetamos a todos y a todos los digamos pensamos de una misma manera eh, son todos los partidos difíciles en realidad entonces eh, enfrentaremos a jugadores que marcan diferencia a nivel individual y también juegue, tienen un, un lindo juego colectivo entonces va a ser un partido exigente y y nosotros, bueno, en búsqueda de, de poder conseguir esta primera victoria. Seguimos en búsqueda de, de tener nuestro estilo bien marcado. Eh, el otro día se vieron cosas importantes y por intermedio de, de todo ese estilo que buscamos, nuestro juego en fase ofensiva, defensiva, eh, en el transcurso del año seguramente ganaremos más del, de las veces que, que no consigamos el resultado. So there you have it, Matias Almeida, the coach himself, saying we will win probably more games than not. Yeah, very bold statement by the Argentine. If you read between the lines, I guess what he's trying to say is that this team is going to make playoffs. The, the sweet number is, the sweet spot is around 34, 35, maybe leaning towards the 40s in terms of overall points. This team is still going to have to take it week in and week out, though. They need to find their style. They need to find their groove. They need to find an itch to really generate and score goals, which is something that the Earthquakes have lacked uh, for the past couple years, aside from last year, uh, ironically. You know, but this, this obviously goes to show that the ethos and, and the overall notion within the locker room is that they really, really do believe that this team has the potential to make playoffs and to be a difference maker, the protagonist this season. And I think that's also going to depend a lot on who the Earthquakes are going to decide to bring in the summer. Is it going to be a DP? They recently just opened up a slot with releasing Joel Quiberger, buying out his or exercising their one season buyout. So it's going to lean a lot on, on that. And, and Matias Almeida is obviously set on, on the notion that his team has the, the cap that they have the capability to make playoffs. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, all in all, 
pretty bold statement by Matias Almeida, putting himself out there that expectations are on now, I guess you can say. Yeah, the comments are there. They're there to reference. It's a good, nice point, though, at 35,000 foot feet. You know, maybe he's a little higher, you know, in terms of where he's thinking of where the team can go and wants the perception of the public and the fans to think that, too, and get them behind the side a little bit more after having such a drury season last year. And you can't fault the forward-thinking nature of a coach that's able to bring the perception, which then potentially could become the reality, really, at the, at the end of the day, um, you know, with, with, with this team. So that's nice to see. Now, switching gears a little bit, I, I wanted to chat uh, a little bit about the topic of MLS fans. And this has come up recently, a Huffington Post article talking about New York City Football Club and having neo-Nazi fans that have been lingering around the club for the past three to four years that the club has known about. They have known about these folks, but have yet to really do much about them until the last six months or so. So there was some really, really in-depth reporting about this. And then the league kind of fell a little bit flat with their response, to be fair. And so just kind of wanted to get your take on it and let's discuss. Well, I think the league, like NYCFC, acknowledged that they were in a pretty bad position for letting it go for so long and not doing anything about it. Lamentable that they did that and that they chose to offer a pretty mellow and laid back, right, statement about what's been going on uh, within the stadium. Uh, these type of environments and people should not be welcomed in any soccer stadium, in, in any place of, of our world, right? It's just, it, it's truly uh, disgusting to say the least. It's, it's very disgusting to know that within our country and, and within this sport, you know, lies these types of people and these types of ideas and are actually thriving. Cause this, from what it sounds like and from what it looks like, you know, the, this, this group of supporters were, were successful at what they were doing, right? Like showing up to games and cheering and supporting with, you know, tattoos of, of fascist symbols and, and X, Y, Z. It's just, it, it shouldn't be accepted. Uh, all of that should be, should have been eradicated a long time ago since it was first mentioned. Uh, obviously though, there's a lot of politics and just a lot of complexities that interfere with these type of things being called out. But there has to be, there has to be uh, a much uh, harsher ruling uh, on these type of activities. Yeah, I mean, the league needs to take a, a better stance and just straight up say that they are not with racist fans. They're uh, against any sort of sexism, any sort of homophobia, against any sort of transphobia. That, that needs to be said by the commissioner, uh, Don Garber, when he goes and says a statement. I, I felt like his statement was tone deaf. I felt like his statement wasn't forward thinking. I felt like his statement was not in coalition with a majority of, of, of fans that support this league, that have brought this league out from the doldrums of just being a little boring soccer league that's a soccer league that supports social justice, that cares about a fundamental change in our country. And when it comes to the intersection of sports and social change, it, it just could have been a lot better. And it's really disappointing to see leaders in our sport, especially the commissioner, not be able to take a stand uh, like this. Um, so really, really, um, you know, tough stuff this week, but credit to the reporting and credit to, you know, our, our journalistic friends that were able to break the story to put this into light. I know a lot of other clubs across the country want to be able to do their part, to have their say, to, to be able to put a refugees welcome banner or welcome sign in their stadium, a, a team that has 49 seats glistened in all sorts of rainbow colors for a hate crime against the LGBT community that sits right in the middle of the stadium, okay, that's not necessarily political. It just has to be done. And so those are little things that can be done that are not political. It's not political to have a, you know, refugees welcome sign, but it is just something that's just part of a game that soccer cultures, ha soccer 
supporters have as part of their culture. Absolutely, it's it's the humane, it's it's the the right thing to do, right? I don't think it it should come into question. The, these are things that are fundamental to every human being. Everyone who you know comes together for a sport or comes together for anything, I think in life, should feel welcomed. And it, it's just not it's not right, right to to do these type of things for for people who who care about the sport. Now, in the game the other day, uh, during the evening, Robert Jonas and yourself and and some other journalists heard the, the P chant um, at Avaya Stadium. Um, this is a separate issue, uh, a separate type of thing than, than this NYC FC thing, but something that does go on in, in Stadia in, in the country and, you know, is somewhat ingrained in culture as well, in, in, in Mexican soccer culture more specifically. But um, again, not a, the best look here and, and really, um, really uh, not great to see, especially after the Quakes had kind of snuffed this out in 2016. Yeah, you know, it, it's lamentable. Again, like I said before, it, these are embarrassing to me. It's embarrassing, you know, to hear these chants. I, as most of you viewers know, and, and you know, Charles, uh, you know, I, I come from Mexican background, uh, Mexican-American first generation, and I understand, right? I, I, I sort of understand the justifications that the Mexican community offers regarding the chant and that it has different connotations and that you can interpret it many ways. I, I understand that, uh, but I do not support the fact that this word is being yelled by thousands of people uh, within the stadium, t directed towards a goalie, uh, you know, around people who don't have that same cultural knowledge. A and, and just in general, the word should not be used in general, I, I, I personally growing up, I never used it in my household. We never use that word. It's just not a word that is welcoming. It's it's a bad word. It's 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 a cuss word, right? And you know, the fact that we're trying to be progressive here and we're we're trying to move on from all this hate and, and from all this uh, apathy. Th this this is this wasn't the right look for the San Jose earthquakes. Um, obviously they do have their set of rules to when situations like this arise, but it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. You know, the, the Mexican Federation, um, the league itself, Liga Mekis, like MLS have been trying for years to try and get rid of this chant and it just keeps going and going and going. I think the best way personally to go about it is sincerely to stop the game. Mm. Stop the game. Don't play it for 10, 20 minutes. Of course, that interferes, though, with league policy and with, you know, the economical and financial side of the game. How are you going to afford the TVs to stay on for an extended 20 or 30 minutes period of time, right? So we get into all those nuances and all those sections that are very political, very legal, I guess in more of a legal sense, but all in all, I mean, the chants need to stop. Uh, I don't know what the right solution to that is. It's disgraceful. Uh, it's it's lamentable that you know these fans show up and that they come in having this in mind that they want to get this word out that they want to you know perform this this chant. It's it, it shouldn't be tolerated. Yeah, I mean, you said it yourself. Also, I think education is a key part right. of just making sure that folks are aware of, of you know, their surroundings and, and who is there um, and what's okay to say. It's a lack say, of education. What's okay to say and what's not okay to say. Yeah. Is Major League Soccer going to be this league that's going to be, you know, hey, we, we don't stand for ra racism or homophobia, transphobia, uh, sexism, um, etc. And they have the opportunity uh, to do that, which is 
which is, uh, you know, I think something that they're going to get down. But uh, being able to be challenged is good. And, um, you know, I'm glad this NYCFC thing came into the fold. And, you know, I'm a little bit shocked we're having this conversation about the P word at Avaya. Uh, the Quakes, normally a very progressive team that's able to stamp this stuff out. And I'm sure that the front office will do whatever it takes to be able to 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 do that. I just took a look at the tweets in midweek um, to, to see what was done in the past. And, um, you know, Jared Shawley, who, who is uh, the COO at the Quakes, said there's no tolerance for that kind of thing and, and they'll go after folks. So, um, this, you know, that, that, that is another thing. And obviously the P word is a controversial thing as right. well. And so there is cultural significance there, yeah. um, you know, with it. So again, two separate issues, but we wanted to end on a little political note with you. And yeah, like I, I always felt that the P-word chant, the discussion about it was going to be inev inevitable with the arrival of Matias Almeida and the potential fans that were going to come into Avaya Stadium, right? Uh, this is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. Uh, we'll try to get to the bottom of it if any or these situations keep keep arising and, and if they keep getting a bit more serious. But, you know, for any of the fans who are watching, Please try to call out the people who are, you know, initiating or participating in in these in these actions. Uh, they shouldn't be tolerated, uh, and they are truly, truly founded on the, the theory of of ignorance. You said it yourself. Education, help out a friend, speak out when you can speak out. That's our show for today. Alongside Joel, my name is Charles. Thank you for tuning in to Black and Azul. Just make sure that you subscribe, like, and maybe tell a friend about it, and then tell that friend to tell another friend about it. Let's keep it going. And as always, ding, 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 ding.